Hello everybody to welcome all of you to this webinar with the title Transferring Real Operating Conditions from Practice into the Laboratory Using the High Force DMA Gabo Eplexor. Um, what matters is how to transfer real operating conditions from practice into laboratory. During operation, technically elastomeric products are subjected to different loads. The static load is constant over time and often corresponds to the own weight. The dynamic load is either externally imposed or defined by a drive and is a function of time. Transferring the real operating conditions from practice into the laboratory is associated with at least one major restriction. It's absolutely mandatory in tension, compression, and bending load tests for the static preload to be larger than the dynamic load. This restriction is due to the fact that a tensile sample can buckle under alternating tensile loads if the dynamic load amplitude exceeds the static load amplitude. Alternating compression load results in a temporary loss of contact between the sample and the sample holder. Correct testing free of artifacts is not possible in this case. But for some application, such as rubber convoy belts, drive belts or rubber metal bearings, the normal use is marked by static preload smaller than the actual dynamic load. Well, I'll try to show you how can this restriction be removed if required using the high force DMA Garbo Eplexon. My name is Sabi Alwi. Well, I'm working at Netch Greater Bauer's application engineer. Um, during the webinar, you can ask questions using the chat function. I will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. While well, I'm working in Alden, 60 kilometers away from Hanover, Alden represents the excellent center for DMA, the Netsch Group. The head office is in Selb in Bavaria. Originally known uh, as Gabo Qualimeter, the company became since 2015 a member of the Netsch Group. But we are still proud of almost 45 years DMA history. The Netsch products are used to perform both thermal and dynamic mechanical analysis. The focus today is the DMA Gabo Eplexo. My talk will have the following sections. The first one is uh, I give you a small overview about the plexor and some basics of dynamic mechanical thermal analysis. Then the question, why do we need dynamic testing or at least high force dynamic testing? Just we will check some uh, reproducibility performance of our, of our equipment. Then after that, we will show some real applications. Well, then I'll summarize. Now I will take a brief look at the dynamic material testing and explain to you our preferred technical implementation. Characteristic for all high force dynamic testing systems, here in the case, the high force DMA Garbo Plexor 500 Newton, is the use of two independent drives. The static drive is a servo motor and allows forces of up to 1,500 Newton and static deformation up to 60 millimeter. The dynamic drive is an electrodynamic shaker which generates an additional plus minus 500 Newton at a maximum amplitude above plus minus six millimeter. How does an eplexor works? Here in this case, the sample, the red cylinder, is subject first to static load and then dynamic load. The force transducer can be exchanged for adapting the dynamic mechanical analyzer according to customer requirements or for determining uh, the deformation optical position sensors are used. 
Now, there's some basics. What we measure using a DMA is mainly the deformation of the force. If we have a sinusoidal deformation according to x t equal x0 times sinus omega t, where x0 is the deformation amplitude and omega is the angular frequency, the force we get has the following form. F on t is equal to F0 times omega t minus delta, where F0 is the force amplitude and delta is the phase angle. In order to compare different test samples and make a reliable statement about them, it's appropriate to derive geometrically independent relative values. Here, the first one is the strain defined as deformation divided by the sample initial length, epsilon t, and the mechanical stress, sigma t, divide, uh, defined as the force, dynamic force in this case, divided by the cross section of the sample A. The relationship between the strain and the mechanical stress obeys the Hooke's law and delivers a characteristic material parameter, E star or the complex modulus of elasticity. In the, in the complex plane, the modulus of elasticity E star can be written as the sum of a real imaginary part according to the equation, the first equations. E star is equal to E prime plus I times I, uh, E double prime, where I is the complex number defined as I squared is equal to minus one. The absolute value of the elasticity modulus is defined as the sum of the squared parts. The quotient of E double prime over E prime is the so-called tangent delta. Or with other terms, this defines the loss factors of the sample. To illustrate those quantities, let me consider our, our following experiment. If a ball is falling down, by reaching the ground, it will be reflected, but do not attain its initial positions. We can conclude that there are different energy contribution in the system. Stored energy, which in turn leads to keep the ball bouncing. And the lost energy, the reason why the ball did not reach its initial positions. Both energy contributions are directly proportional to the loss or storage modulus. For the dissipating energy, we are talking about dash pod like behavior. This represents the viscous irreversible response of the sample, also proportional to the loss modulus, E double prime, and the stored energy or spring like. This represents the elastic reversible response of the sample also known as the storage modulus E prime. All this parameter, all these quantities, depends on temperature, time, and frequency. Now to the next section, why do you need a high force DMA? Well, the measuring instruments are available not only to deliver results in, in the linear viscoelastic deformation range, but also can test up to the non-linear deformation range. Especially for elastomer composites with a large deformation range, high force testing is a must. I would like to briefly explain that. Let me consider a simple example. The geometry for one sample or compression samples, in this case is a cylinder, 10 millimeter line, with a diameter of 10 millimeter. When we make temperature sweep, 
to investigate the thermal behavior, a carbon blood filled SBR sample in this case. I use a heating rate of 2 Kelvin per minute. Dynamic frequency is 10 Hertz. The static strain was 0.5%. The dynamic strain was plus minus 0.15%. This uh, matches the deformation of about plus minus 15 micrometer. Now we have to make some calculations. We know the dynamic amplitude. We know the Young's modulus formula, the relationship between the mechanical stress sigma and the deformation. The mechanical stress sigma is defined as the elasticity modulus times deformation. And the mechanical stress is also the force over cross sections. So we can derive that the force we need for material with elasticity modulus E at deformation epsilon is the following. F is equal to E times epsilon times, times A. Now for our samples, we know in the glassy plateau, for rubber samples, we have modulus of about 3,500 megapascal. In this case, uh, a temperature of minus 80 degrees Celsius. We make the calculation we found out that the dynamic force we need to make such kind of measurements is for about plus minus five, 420 Newton. We need a high static force to keep the contact between the sample and the sample holder. Let me assume that the static force should be larger than 450, 450 Newton. It means to do to make this experiment temperature sweep for this sample with this geometry, we need at least 900 Newton to make this experiment. Well, very important point, also the reproducibility performance of our equipment, the plexar. Temperature sweeps were performed now to investigate the thermal behavior of a carbon black filled HMBR samples. Here, three samples on the same starting materials. As you can see, the curves are perfectly superimposed. The modulus of elasticity is almost identical. Um, the same thing for the damping factors, tangents delta. Again, the results are perfectly on top of it. The curves are almost identical. Now to go to the, show you some applications. We have first to consider some points. Um, we, have, have, we have to perform dynamic mechanical thermal analysis in different test geometries. This is what we can do. High forces and deformation range should be provided. This we have it. We have to have also like flexible measurement settings and sample handling, as simple as possible. Well, then um, at the end, we need high resolution and repeatability of the measurements. The first example, real example, real application issue is the metal cushions. Metal cushions are moldings made from a wire mesh set with elastic properties, which are used on their own in combination with fittings. They optimize um, isolation, isolation, or uh, reduce noise. Typical application are power trains or um, some body works, some adds on parts, engines. Um, they have um, the benefits that um, the metal cushions are resistant to age, no permanent deformation, no hardening, and no creeping. They have a long lifespan, and then they require little space, so they are also easy to mount. Here, the metal cushions, the sample holder, 
for compressions. The compression sample here have um, two different diameters. The bottom one has a diameter of 50 millimeters. So the upper one is about 30 millimeters. Here, I'd just like to show you that we can do, um, can produce um, the geometry you need. Now, just some results. First, I start with the frequency sweep made in compression mode. Here, the static strain was about 15%, and the dynamic strain was plus minus 5%. This corresponds to static force of 175 Newton, a dynamic force of 140 Newton. The temperature was room temperature, 23 degrees Celsius. Well, in the picture, we see in the x-axis this frequency in the left y-axis of the modulus of elasticity, the blue curve, almost frequency independent, and the tangents delta, uh, the red curve, which, um, which is frequency independent for small frequency, smaller than, let me say, 10 hertz, well, then we have a small increase after that direction of high frequencies. Well, another time, another strain sweep here in this case. As you can see, the modulus is load amplitude dependent. This due to the available air cavities and the wire form of the metal caches. In contrast, with shear experiments, as I show you, is absolutely mandatory in compression load tests that the static preloads should be higher than the dynamic load. This restriction is due to the fact that tensile sample can buckle under entertaining tensile loads. If the dynamic load amplitude exceeds the static load component, alternating pressure loads result in a temporary loss of contact between the sample and the sample holder. It means in this case, the correct testing free of artifacts is not possible. That's why here the static force is larger than, than the maximal dynamic force used for these measurements. Well, but um, for some applications, such as rubber conveyor belts or drive belts or rubber metal puffer, deviation from the rule that the static preload must be higher than the actual dynamic load may occur in practice if backling or lifting is prevented by other technical measures. By means of the option or parameter a low alternating load, the restriction that the dynamic load should be smaller than the static load can be removed if required. In this mode, it's therefore also possible to exactly simulate the load simulation of the respective applications. Here, as an example, I choose rubber metal buffers. They are a shock absorber for use more or less in all industry fields. They can be used to insulate shocks and vibrations or um, isolate machine vibrations um, or uh, reduce the acceleration and protect against noise. There are different types of them. You can find something with the two stand balls or uh, with one stand ball plus one threaded hole or with two threaded uh, holes or just with one set balls. Um, the material also, they have uh, different um, materials are used or uh, the, with different hardness. Anyway, here in this case, I'll just show some results for rubber metal buffers with the two stud balls on with one cell ball plus one threaded hole. We have here 
a possibility just to produce in this case special sample holder and if needed some extension pieces this is what a built-in vibration damper in plexer look like the left picture is uh, talking about two uh, rubber metal buffer with the two start balls on the right picture the rubber metal buffer with one set balls plus one threaded hole starting with the strain, strain sweep and compression mode you can see in the setting parameter that the static strain is equal to zero percent while the dynamic strain or the maximal one is about plus minus four percent this corresponds to static force of zero newton a maximal dynamic force of 240 newton the picture shown on the left describes on the x-axis the dynamic deformation and the left y-axis the modulus of elasticity the blue curve and the right y-axis is the tangens delta or red curve as you can see the modulus decreases with increasing deformation due to continuous damage of the filler network of the rubber components of the rubber metal buffers this matches with the pain effect due as i say uh, due to the rubbery component of the rubber metal buffers in this case tangents delta increases accordingly because the inner fraction increases with the increasing deformation here we can check the value of the static as well as dynamic force supply in this case the, the static force is the gray curve you can see it's not really equal to zero but it's about 0 0.3 because um, perhaps as you know we have to give all the time some tolerance for the systems when well, this case was the tolerance 0 0.5 newton it means in the settings parameter and settings file the static force choose was zero plus minus 0 0.5 newton the dynamic force is the red curve but in all the cases you can see that the dynamic force for all amplitudes for all frequencies in this case are larger than the static force we can make some frequency sweep and compression for the static strain he is zero percent corresponding to a static force of zero newton but the maximum dynamic strain here was plus minus two percent corresponding to maximum dynamic force of 230 newton as you can see the blue curve the hell blue curve or the light blue curve is deformation of 0.05 percent on the black curve the last one the deformation is or was two percent what we can see is that the modulus elasticity modulus decreases or increases first with the increasing frequencies this um, is the case for all frequencies for all um, deformation but we can see also that the modulus decreases with increasing dynamic deformation another time uh, due to the breakage or distraction of the filler network this corresponds more or less to the pain effect for rubbery materials we can see also the tangents delta here in this case tangents delta as expected increases with increasing frequencies but the tangents delta also 
uh, increases with increasing dynamic deformation. This is the case because the inner fraction increases with increasing deformation too. We can check through this measurement for all different amplitudes, the force used or the force amount used. You can see the static force here is the curve. The on the bottom, the gray curve is about 0.3 percent. So most of the same thing as said before. It's in the tolerance range, which was plus minus 0.5 percent. Uh, I'm sorry, 0.5 Newton. But um, for dynamic forces, more dynamic force was or were needed with increasing um, the dynamic, the dynamic strain. Here we can uh, make some kind of time sweeps and compression mode. It's more realistic case in this case. It means we keep uh, the dynamic force constant at 200 Newton. This corresponds to dynamic strain of plus minus 3.5 percent. With that, on chance we change or we vary uh, the amount of the static force at the time, starting from zero Newton for the um, light blue curve, then 40 Newton for the red curve, then 90 Newton for the yellow curve. The green curve is what about 140 Newton. Well, then um, we make um, the opposite directions. Then it means for the orange curve we have static load of about 105 Newton, then 55 Newton. On the last step was about seven Newton. Seven Newton. What we can see that for all this kind of measurements, the dynamic case or the dynamic force is larger than the static one. We can also calculate the mechanical stresses. The static one is the blue curve, and the dynamic one is the red one. It means for some real applications like rubber metal buffers, we have also the possibility to measure not only some material sheets to get another view, to get an idea about the material properties, but we can also measure final products, even if the dynamic load is larger than the static one. When here I come to the summary, I show you that high forces are needed when the nonlinear deformation range is considered, or when materials with large dimension are tested. High resolution due to optical sensors. The curves for reproducibility uh, tests, the curves are most identical. Uh, that's very important. I'll also show you that um, or how standard diplexer can be extended. In this case, um, it is also possible to exactly simulate the low situation of um, real applications when deviation from the rule um, that the static preload might be higher than the actual dynamic load may occur in practice by means of the parameter a low alternating load. I come to the end of my slides. Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to ask questions. You will have, uh, you will find the right hand side in the toolbar. I'll try to answer as many questions. Thank you very much. Another time for your